Maranatha, my brothers and my sisters, and welcome to our Sabbath School Study Hour. I am Carlos Munoz. I am the director of AFCO, the Amazing Facts Center of Evangelism, an associate speaker, bilingual speaker for Amazing Facts. And I am here excited about this last lesson on this wonderful study on the great controversy. And so we are the closing week, week number 13, that we're going to be talking about. And so before we jump into our study, I want to remind you of the free gift offer that we have for you. This week's offer is called Anything But Secret, and there are three ways that you can get it. You can call 1-866-788-3966 and ask for an offer number 106. The other way is you can text us if you live in the United States. You can text us the SH008 to the number 40544. Or if you're outside of the United States and Canada, you can go to our website, study.aftv.org slash SH008. Let's have a word of prayer. Father, thank you for this opportunity again to study your word as we come, Father. And we gave the final great news, the closing of this great controversy, Father, as you, how you're going to put an end to this world of pain and sin and suffering. And so we thank you, Father, for this great news that we are going to share and that this news may rejoice in our hearts and that this may want us to draw closer and closer to you. We thank you for this study, Father, and we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. And so as we study in the, this theme of the great controversy, I want to just highlight that there are three main accusations in the great controversy. The devil has thrown three main accusations at the enemy. When I did my study on the sanctuary, I talked a, a little bit about these, but what are those three main accusations? Number one, the devil says, God is selfish and God does not deserve your love and your service. He asks you to serve, but he is not self-serving. He is not surrendering. Number two, the other accusation is God is, is, is unjust because he has made a law that is incapable of uh, human beings of keeping. He's, look at how mean he is. He puts this standard so high that you can't reach and then he judges you for it. And then the third main accusation in the great controversy is that God can't solve the problem of sin and pain and suffering in this world because he created this world and thus he is the responsible one for it. So how can he be trusted to put an end to this problem. And so what we're going to see, my brothers and my sisters, and we have been seeing through this study lesson, is how God has answered each and every one of those accusations. Why? So that there is no doubt through the rest of the universe, through any created being, that God is love and that God deserves all the glory and all the honor. In the previous lesson, you finished with what is the scenes of the seven plagues and the loud cry and God's last people giving the last message. And right today, what we're going to be talking about is the close of probation or what is called hope in the time of trouble from the lesson on Sunday. And so this is talking about the time after probation has closed, after every, uh, everybody has decided whether they're going to be sealed by God or marked by the enemy, now what happens is probation is closing, and now the end, no, there's no opportunity more. Those that, are, those that are unclean remain unclean. Those that are just remain just. And now during this time period of known as the great time of tribulation, the great time of trouble, now the enemy is going to carry out his final battle against God's people, but this is going to be the greatest manifestation of the love of God also, in regard to that, as he guides us through this horrific time of trouble. And notice Jesus speaks about this in Matthew chapter 24, and it's beautiful how Jesus breaks it down in a very orderly fashion, the whole scene of how the end is going to come if you read Matthew chapter 24. But notice what Jesus says in Matthew 24, verse 21. For there will be great tribulation, this is the great time of trouble, such as has not been since the beginning of the world until this time, no, nor what? Nor ever shall they be. Jesus is telling us that this time of tribulation is the worst that the earth has ever seen. There have been small times of trouble in different time periods in different phases. For example, what happened to Jesus and the early church. What happened during the, the time of the Inquisition in Europe and, and the Reformation, right? The persecution and all of that. But what he's saying is, in the end, this final battle, this final conflict is going to be the worst time ever. And if we continue to read, he says, 
if it was not shortened, nobody would be saved. And so Jesus is telling us there's going to come a great time of tribulation as the enemy is going to be unleashed. He's going to be, he's going to be free to do whatever he wants. But Revelation chapter 7 says there's one group of people that he cannot put his finger on. And those are God's sealed people. Those are God's sealed people. As the remnant, as this final battle it rages on the battle of Armageddon, as is mentioned in Revelation chapter 12, verse 17, that the enemy went to make war with the offspring or the remnant of the, of the seed, which is Jesus Christ, those that keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. Versus this other woman, right? This Babylon in Revelation chapter 13 and 14 and 17, which is making war on God's people because we see that Babylon is on the beast and the beast is making war against the remnant of God in this final battle, this final conflict on the earth. And so what God is doing is how is God going to guide us and protect us during this time? It says in Revelation 7 that God's people have the seal of God or they have the name of God or they have the character of God. You see, my brothers and my sisters, God will not let us go through this time of tribulation if, he, if we do not have the mind of Christ, if we do not have the faith of Christ, which is that total dependence on the power and the righteousness and the merits of God. And so once God's people are sealed, once God's people have had a complete and total surrender to God, as Christ did, the people are sealed. Those are identified as God's people. And then God says, you know what? I can let them go through this time of trouble because I know that they will never depend on self. They will always depend on me. And through the power of the Holy Spirit, God's people during this time of trouble, during this final phase on this earth, before God puts an end to this world, God then lets the enemy do whatever he wants. But of course, God's people are sealed. God's people are protected. And where is this protection? Where is this special protection that God's people need in the end time? Notice what it says in Psalms chapter 27, verse 5. For in the time of trouble, he, notice how it, it, it exalts God is doing all the work. He, God, shall hide me in his pavilion, in his dwelling place, in the secret place of his tabernacle, he shall hide me. Notice, he shall protect me. He shall guide me. He shall walk over me. He shall set me where? Up high. He shall elevate us like an eagle elevates over the enemies. And he shall put us upon, it says a rock, but I like to say it says upon the rock because Christ is our rock. And so my brothers and my sisters, where is our protection in this end times? It is in our intimate daily consecrated relationship to God, that total complete dependence upon God where God says, come into me and I will protect you, right? We see this also symbolized through the ark of the, the flood where God says, you need to come into me. You need to be with me and I will put my wings around you. I will guide you. It was in the ark, watch this, that God protected Noah and his family during what was also a type of the end time destruction. My brothers and my sisters, in the end time, guess where do we need to be? We need to be in the ark also, amen? We need to be uh, holding on to God, holding on to God's promises, the ark of the covenant, the promises of God that he was going to save us and solve the problem of sin. And so we are to hold on also to our high priest who is there ministering on our behalf. We are to hold on to the promises of God, to the word of God in that sense. As Jesus Christ is finishing this work, remember the study we did, I actually did with you on the sanctuary, this final phase of Christ cleansing his people from their sins, preparing us to meet our maker, that special, special period where he is going to come to the earth and his people are to be ready. God promises in Ephesians chapter 5, verse 25, that he is going to have his bride pure and clean without sin or wrinkle or anything. She's going to be perfectly prepared for him. And so as Christ finishes his work as high priest, probation has closed. The Bible tells us that he will take off his garments as high priest. And now he comes in a special way. Daniel chapter 12, verse 1, and at that time, Michael shall stand up, right? Now watch this. If Michael stands up, what does that imply? That he was what? He was seated. Now, where was he seated? At the right hand of the throne of God, interceding on our behalf, upholding 
taking our sins and upholding us through his imparted righteousness through the power of the Holy Spirit. But when he stands up from being seated at the right hand of the Father, it says that he will what? He will come and there shall be what? That time of trouble, such as never was since there was a nation, even to that time. Again, the same thing that Jesus said in Matthew chapter 24. It's going to be the worst ever because it's going to cover the whole earth. It's not going to be in pockets in different places in the world. This time of trouble is going to cover the whole entire earth. But notice what it says here. But at that time, your people shall be what? Your people shall be delivered. Why? Because Christ is going to finish his work as our high priest. And he is going to take off his garments and he's going to dress himself as King of King and Lord of Lords. And he's going to return now. Why? Because his people are under the worst type of persecution. The enemy has brought all the armies of the world, all the battle of Armageddon. Everyone is now on the enemy's side as the Holy Spirit has left those that have rejected him. He's still with God's people. And now the enemy riles up all the armies and the enemies of the, of the world against God's people. But it says that what happens? That the time shall come where your people will be delivered. And this is Monday's lesson, which is what? Hope in Jesus soon return. And what we see, my brothers and my sisters, is that Jesus Christ, he will come as a king of king and lord of lords that it's mentioned in Revelation chapter 19. And he is going to come with all his billions and billions and billions and billions of angels, says Matthew 24, with all the glory and all the lighting. Why? To liberate his people, to free us from the enemy in that sense, to put an end to this world because now the enemy has free reign. And Christ says, I'm going to show you enemy. I'm going to show you devil that even if I let you have do whatever you want, you can't touch my people. This is similar or this is the type of what happened with Job in, 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 in many ways. But he's saying, but they'll still be faithful to me. And so as God's people are faithful during this final time period, as God's people are being upheld by the Holy Spirit and by the faith of Jesus, God says, now I'm going to come and I'm going to put an end to this. To this. And I'm going to come and I'm going to put an end and destroy all the kings of the earth all of those that are attacking God's people. But there is also, aside from the destruction of the enemies of God in the battle of Armageddon, there's also something very special that happens. Go with me, please, to the book of Thessalonians, if you have your Bibles, and look at what it says in the book of Thessalonians regarding the return of Jesus Christ. There's something special aside from just destroying the enemies and everybody that's coming against us. Notice what it says in 1 Thessalonians Chapter 4, it says in a beautiful, beautiful way, it says, verse number 15, For this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain shall, until the coming of the Lord, will by no means precede those who are asleep. Those that are asleep are those that have died. Remember, there are two groups of saved when Christ returns. There are those that have been sleeping in the tomb, right? The Bible says, Jesus says that they're asleep, they're waiting to be awake, and then you have those that are alive that are God's sealed people in the end times. Those that have the seal of God. They are, those are alive and those that are dead. And notice what it says. It's saying that those that are alive are not going to go to heaven with Christ before those that are dead in Christ. All right? What's going to happen? Notice what it says here. Verse number 16. 1 Thessalonians 4, 16. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout and with the voice of the archangel and with the trumpet of God and the dead in Christ will rise up first. Amen. At that moment, my brothers and my sisters, all the tombs of those that died in Christ will be resurrected on that day. We, if we are alive on that day, we will see them. And if we're not alive, then we will be resurrected. I'm, I'm saying this because I'm, I know you and I, we are going to be there. We're going to persevere in Christ and trust in his word and his, and his promises. And it says here that we shall be resurrected or those will be resurrected with us and we will be together. And notice what it says first, verse 17. Then we who are alive and remain, those are those that did not die, they are those sealed God's people, shall be caught up. That's that concept of rapture, right? Caught up, taken together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, my brothers and my sisters. Amen. This is not some secret rapture. This is anything but secret as the, uh, the lesson, as the free offer gives. It's a rumptuous, it's Christ coming with all the billions and billions and billions and billions of angels. The earth is shaking. It's a monument. To, it's an event that the universe has never seen nor will ever see in the history 
of the return of Christ to liberate his people and free us. And as all those are resurrected, come together. What does it say? The angels come down, it says in Matthew 24, and pick us up and we meet where? We meet our Lord in the clouds of glory. Amen? And that is the promise that Jesus says, I left. But he says in John chapter, four, in John chapter 14, I'm going to leave, but I shall return. And I'm going to return and I'm going to take you where I am so that you can be with me. And that, my brothers and my sisters, gives start of what is on Tuesday, the study of the millennium. Now, the millennium is this thousand, pe this thousand year period that is marked by the return of Jesus Christ. Once the return of Jesus Christ comes, now you have two situations. You have those that have been taken to heaven. We'll talk about them in a minute. And then you have those that have been uh, that are here on earth. Those that died, right, that were dead, did not die in Christ, and then they died in the second coming, plus the angels. Notice what it says in Revelation chapter 20. I want you to join me, please. Revelation chapter 20 gives us the scenario of this end times. Revelation chapter 20, verse number one. After Christ comes, all those that didn't, are not in Christ are dead. The devil is here on earth, and the saved have been taken, those resurrected with Christ to heaven. And it says in Revelation 21, Then I saw an angel coming down from heaven, having the key to the bottomless pit, and a great chain in his hand. This bottomless pit is the abyss. And he laid hold of the dragon, the serpent of old, who is the devil and Satan, and bound him for a thousand years. So now the devil is here on the earth, the abyss. If you go to Genesis chapter 1, it says the earth before creation. And Genesis chapter 1, verse 2, was an empty void, an abyss, because there was nothing on it. Then God six days creates. The seven plagues are going to undo the six days. And that means that the earth reverts or returns to its empty and void abysmal state. And that's the prison that the devil is going to be on for how long? For a thousand years. And notice how it continues. And he cast him into the bottomless pit, the abyss, and shut him up and set a seal on him so that he should deceive the nations no more. Notice this. Until the thousand years were finished. Amen. Amen. And so during a thousand years, the devil, remember, all the saved have left with Christ. The devil is on this earth for a thousand years. He's in his prison, right? He's not literally chained, but he can't deceive. He, there's nobody to deceive. Everybody is dead. Those that followed him are dead. And those that were with Christ were taken into heaven in that sense. And so this is this time period known as the millennium here on earth where the devil will be for a thousand years contemplating what is about to come, which is the final sentence. And that leads us into Wednesday, judgment in the millennium. Because at the same time that here on earth, this is happening, my brothers and my sisters, Christ is going to take us to heaven. Amen. And what's going to happen in heaven? You ever thought about what are we going to do in heaven, right? Especially during this time period of the millennium. Notice what it says in Revelation chapter 19, verse number 9. It says here, Right, blessed are those who are called to the marriage supper of the Lamb. And so we are going to, the first thing that happens when we get into heaven is we're going to have the marriage supper. We're going to sit at the table. And the book of Luke says that Christ will serve us again, showing his humility, showing his love for us, showing his, 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 his spirit of servant, right? For us and for all of his created beings, like we saw in the sanctuary, the service of God. God is serving us. He is doing everything. Our part is stop fighting and resisting and let God do what he wants. And so Christ, we're going to sit down and we're going to have that marriage supper, right? Which is a type of the supper, the, the communion service that we have. When we, when, we, when we celebrate communion, it's not just looking backwards to what Christ did for us in the past, but looking to the future, to what we would, when we're going to be there in heaven and we're going to sit down. And something else fascinating is going to happen. There's going to be a judgment scene. Notice what it says in Revelation chapter 20. Verse 4, and then I saw thrones and they sat on them. That's us, those, all the redeemed. And judgment was committed to them, to us. And I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded for the witness of Jesus and the word of God who had not worshipped the beast or his image or received his mark on their forehead or on their hand. And they lived and reigned with Christ for how long? For a thousand years. Years And so during the millennium, my brothers and my sisters, this would be phase two of the judgment. We studied previously in the lesson that I shared with you and some of the others, the concept of judgment, right? Which is not to condemn. Remember, judgment is not to condemn. Judgment is to vindicate. In this sense, now that all the saved are in heaven, now what happens? Now there are questions. Why is this person here? 
when, or why is this person not here? So in this second phase of judgment, God is opening the books to all the saved, right? The universe already sent, saw the books, but now he is opening it to us because we're going to have lots of questions. One of the most famous ones is, what is Saul, what is uh, um, Stephen going to do when he sees Paul, right? When he sees Saul, what is he doing here? Well, God is going to uncover and reveal everything. Why those that are saved, they're saved. And why those that are not there are lost. And that's the purpose of the second phase where God will reveal all things. And during that millennium, we're going to be judges. We're going to be sitting down and we're going to be not only judging the, the decisions, but the, really what is we're looking at God. God is once again vindicating his character by opening the books and let us participate of this. And then after the millennium is over, once all has been cleared and God and everybody knows why those that are lost are lost and those that are saved and that God has been fair and just with every human being, that any human being that is lost is not because God chose that they be lost, but because they rejected the free gift of grace and mercy that was given to them in Jesus Christ from before the foundation of the world. And then all of a sudden, my brothers and my sisters, the Bible says that the new Jerusalem descends. We're going to come back with Christ to the earth. After the millennium is over and as we come back, my brothers and my sisters, it says that the new Jerusalem is now st established here on this earth. And what happens when the new Jerusalem is established here on this earth after the millennium? Notice what it says in Revelation chapter 20, verse 7. Now, when the thousand years had expired, Satan was released from his prison and he went out to deceive the nations which are in the four corners of the earth. In other words, the dead are resurrected. We see that in the previous verses where it says that after a thousand years, look at what it says in verse number five. But the rest of the dead did not live again until the thousand years were finished. So after the millennium is over, what happens? Those that were lost are resurrected. Satan galvanizes them again. Right now he's let go of his prison because he, now he has people to deceive. And he says, let's take the city. Let's take the new Jerusalem. Let's bring it down. And notice what it says in Revelation chapter 20, verse number nine. And they went up to the breath of the earth and surrounded the camp of the saints and the beloved city. And so my brothers and my sisters, Satan once again deceives all the nations to try to take the new Jerusalem, right? Again, we see here how he's never repented, how his heart really was and everybody else is trying to take the new Jerusalem. But at that moment, the Bible says that Christ comes out of the new city. It says in Revelation chapter 20, verse number 11, Then I saw a great white throne, and him who sat on it, from those fact the earth and the heaven fled away, and there was no found no place for them. And I saw the dead, small and great, standing before God, and the books were open, and the book, another book was open, which is the book of life, and the dead were judged according to their works. And so my brothers and my sisters, Christ comes out uh, among the people and they look and they see the savior of humanity. They see him. And it says that this next phase of judgment, they now see their lives as their lives, their books are open and they see why they are not in the new Jerusalem, why they are not in the new city as Christ comes. And this phase of judgment at the end, it says in second and Philippians chapter two, that all knees shall bow down and confess that God is good, that Jesus Christ is the Lord. And everybody's going to recognize that the only reason they are not saved, I'm talking about those that are outside of the city, is because they rejected the grace of God. They themselves will confess that God has been just and good and treated everybody with the same love and mercy, but they have rejected the love of God. And then it says very clearly in Revelation chapter 20, verse number nine, it says, and they went up to the breath of the earth and surrounded the camp of the saints and the beloved city and fire came down from God out of heaven and devoured them. And so what is God doing? He is executing his judgment. He is cleansing the earth, my brothers and my sisters, from the stain of, of, of sin and everything. He is making, preparing to make a new earth. And this is, if you remember, we talked about the four stages of the gospel or the God's plan of salvation. Number one, the revealed righteousness of God. It says in, in Romans chapter 2, verse 4, for the goodness of God leads us to repentance. The lie of sin, which the devil has brought on earth, God reveals through his love in Jesus Christ, and people are, are now seeing the light of God. Then we have the imputed righteousness. We talked about that as justification, where the penalty of sin now is being pay, is paid by Christ, and his life is given to us, and our sin, he takes it the imputed righteousness. And then you have the power of sin. 
The imparted righteousness was, is sanctification. God now cleanses us. We talked about this when Christ dwells in us, the hope of glory. And now the power of the Holy Spirit and this body which was dead to sin is now alive to righteousness. And now God imparts his righteousness so that we can live in life. And then here's the last phase of the plan of salvation. Executed righteousness, which is what? God putting an end to the presence of sin. God eliminating and destroying sin from this world, from sin forever. Why? Because if you love somebody, you are not going to let them suffer and go through pain and suffering. You're going to inter intercede. And this is God, after he gives all of the lost a chance, he is going to put an end to their misery. He is going to put an end because he's not going to let the saved continue to suffer through pain and sin and suffering. The lost have had their chance. They have rejected it. And now God cleanses and purifies the earth. Why? Because now he creates a new heaven and a new earth. Amen? A new heaven and a new earth. And notice what it says in Revelation chapter 21, verse number 4. And I heard another loud voice from, from heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with them. And look at what it says in verse 4. And God will wipe away their tear and there shall be no more death, no more sorrow, no more crying, no more pain, no more suffering, no more murder, nothing. There shall be no more pain for but former things have passed Away, my brothers and my sisters, the new heavens and the new earth. God promises he's going to put an end to all of this sin and pain and suffering. And I don't know if there's a more a beautiful phrase than the new earth. A new earth, my brothers and my sisters. God is offering us this. After his character has been vindicated, he says it is done and the new earth is ours. Do you want to participate of this new earth, of this promise that God has by showing and accepting what God has done for us and saying, Lord, this world of pain and sin, I reject it. I want to live for your glory. I hope that is your prayer today. It is my prayer. And so let's pray together for God to fulfill his promises. Father, we thank you as you have fulfilled your past promises and your present ones. You know that we, you will fulfill the future ones of a new heavens and a new earth. And so we thank you for this promise, Father. And we ask that you guide us and direct us and be with us so that we can rejoice to dwell in your presence for the rest of eternity and rejoice in all that you have created in this infinite universe. Thank you for these promises. Thank you for the blessing. Thank you for the plan of salvation. And we thank you for the Holy Spirit. And because all of this is through your son, Jesus Christ. We thank you, Father, and we ask this in his name. Amen. God bless. Don't forget to request today's life-changing free resource. Not only can you receive this free gift in the mail, you can download a digital copy straight to your computer or mobile device. To get your digital copy of today's free gift, simply text the keyword on your screen to 40544 or visit the web address shown on your screen. And be sure to select the digital download option on the request page. It's now easier than ever for you to study God's Word with amazing facts wherever and whenever you want. And most important, to share it with others.